What comes to mind when I mention early VR headsets? Do you think of the Vive and the Oculus? Maybe you think back on early VR and you picture something like the Virtual Boy. You know, it's like a quaint little device that burns out your retinas, but was absolutely nothing like the VR we have today. Well, what if I told you that virtual reality, head-mounted displays that look and function pretty similarly to modern day devices that we use today can be traced all the way back to the iPhone. No, not the iPhone, the iPhone. <laughs> This was the first head-mounted display that resembles modern VR. And it was released by a company called VPL Research in 1989. Actually, a bit of correction. Although VPL was working on the research devices with NASA, um, the first commercially available headset was actually the Cyberface. They beat the iPhone to market by three months. They used gloves, known as the data gloves, as their controllers to interact with the virtual world. By the early 90s, they even developed what they called the data suit for full body tracking in VR. Soon after that, arcades would start filling up with the VR machines created by a company called Virtuality. Virtuality offered a few different experiences, both standing and sitting, some of which were even multiplayer, like an arena shooter named Dactyl Nightmare and a dungeon diving adventure puzzle game called Legend Quest. VR was such a craze back then that even Sega began developing a VR headset. It was meant to be one of the many peripherals for the Sega Genesis. It was announced in 1991 and the project was meant to be the first affordable at-home VR headset and was slated to release in 1993. However, after a lot of advertising and a delay in 1994, the project was eventually shut down before launch after too many reports of severe motion sickness, which, you know, makes sense considering it was running on a Sega Genesis. The other early VR companies would follow a similar fate as just a few short years after releasing the iPhone, VPL Research would go bankrupt and Virtuality would dissolve in 1997. So what went wrong? Well, the costs for these early VR setups were extremely expensive. Like if you thought the Vario was expensive, listen to this. Your own virtual reality laser machine with its built-in headset and handset at £45,000. <laughs> Yeah, I'd love that. <laughs> I'd, yeah, I'd love virtual reality, but the price. <laughs> I wouldn't really ever think of <laughs> ever getting that anyway. So that was for the virtuality, but the iPhone, for the full setup, including a computer powerful enough to run it, cost $240,000. This really puts into perspective just how ambitious the Sega VR was, considering it was targeting a $200 price tag around the same time. And beyond just the issue with costs, the headsets were bulky, uncomfortable, and inconvenient. Oh my god, I I think I have to take this helmet off. I'm physically feeling the spacer for a second. Oh my god. High cost, discomfort, inconvenience, these are all very familiar issues even for modern day VR. The difference between back then and now is that modern headsets are actually good. The resolution on those early machines were super low. The iPhone had a resolution of 320 by 240 per eye, but the virtuality machine's a little better at 276 by 372 per eye. But it wasn't just the resolution. These machines often got very low frame rates, sometimes in the single digits, which was likely not very comfortable. With the performance like this, it's pretty easy to see why VR faded into obscurity for like 15 years. It was just laying low, waiting for its time to shine, when technology would finally catch up to its ambitious nature. Which brings us to today, where the technology has, well, you know, it's it's good enough. Cost for a good, decent VR headset has finally started to lower to a reasonable level, with options like the Quest 2 reducing the barrier to entry into VR as much as possible. But while adoption rate is growing, it's still a pretty low user base, and the unfortunate reality is VR doesn't really make that much money, at least in the grand scheme of the overall gaming market. As you can see at this little sliver right here, which is only about 1% of total revenue, including hardware and software sales. Which puts VR in the classic Catch-22 situation, where people want to see these big exciting games come out before they're convinced to make the leap to purchase the hardware. But you would be hard pressed to convince any company with the necessary resources to do so without the absolute guarantee of a big payout. This is compounded by the fact that VR games are decidedly harder to produce than traditional games. You can't just turn any game not meant for VR into a VR game without considerable thought into the unique challenges posed by the medium. Take for instance Skyrim VR. This is a prime example of why slapping a free moving head and hand tracking onto any old game is not enough. 
The game was vomit inducing to the point where I originally had to refund it because it was simply unplayable. Not to mention a complete lack of interaction meaningful to VR made it a more inconvenient and overall worse way to play the game. Fortunately though, the VR community is filled with very talented and passionate devs and fans. And modders have basically fixed all of the problems with Skyrim VR. From better textures, to revamping the interactions, the combat, the UI, modders have completely reworked nearly every aspect of the game. Skyrim VR is essentially the game of Theseus. But it's not just the modders. The VR community as a whole is one of the most welcoming and helpful communities in gaming, as they're just a bunch of enthusiasts that really want their medium to grow and flourish. The way we see it, the more people have an easier time getting into VR, the better chances there are of getting more and cooler experiences to be produced. Speaking of cool experiences, let's actually talk about, well, the, the experience. What is it that VR does that separates it from traditional gaming? Well, of course, the first thing that comes to mind is immersion. But immersion is kind of this broad word that doesn't really do justice to the feeling that it's trying to invoke. If you've ever tried to take a picture of a mountain or the ocean, then you probably understand the disappointment of looking at that picture and realizing it doesn't really capture the vastness of what you feel in person. That right there is essentially the difference between being immersed in a traditional game versus the immersion of a VR title. Though, there are some caveats that we'll get to. There's more to the immersion than just the vastness of everything. It also has a lot to do with the interactions. The common act of picking up an object, reloading a gun, or even drawing a bowstring goes from a simple button press to an engaging and often very satisfying set of granular physical actions. And while this definitely plays to the strength of VR, it's also a big design challenge for the developers, as these once simple actions aren't so simple anymore. And you often have to make a lot more things interactable, as seeing something in VR and not being able to interact with it when you think you should is somehow way more disappointing than a traditional game. And while that's one of the big caveats to designing immersion in VR, the biggest caveat, in my opinion, is the problem with locomotion. Because motion sickness is very common, and unfortunately, I'm one of the unlucky ones susceptible to it. I want nothing more than to be free to roam around a VR world. But let's be honest, teleporting, it's pretty lame. Anytime I play an adventure game and it wants me to explore in VR, I feel like I'm being shackled by one of those comically large cartoon ball and chains. For example, let's look at Half-Life Alex. That game is incredibly detailed. It has tons of interactions and is overall like the pinnacle of what a VR game could be. But I have to use the teleport, which for the most part is fine. The game does a really good job of catering to this by giving you the randles, you know, those gloves with the gravity pull mechanic, which is not only cleverly useful, but also very fun and satisfying. And a lot of the combat situations are set up to be like a hallway scenario to avoid having to move too much. Well, most of the combats anyway. There are a couple, however, that put you in a situation where you're surrounded and these suck for teleporting, especially in the dark areas where the teleport hand is also my light hand and also my reload and all of which very much conflict with one another. And that's kind of the real problem with teleporting is that it kind of forces you to choose between moving and taking an action, which is not how other games and also real life works. Whenever I'm in those situations, I often just choose to sit there and let things hit me while I shoot at them or do whatever it is I'm attempting to do. And while I really love that game, I can only imagine how much more I would love it if I didn't have to deal with my motion sickness and can just use the joystick movement. There is hope though, as a recent study last year suggests that you can actually train your brain to get over motion sickness, which I have a video about coming soon. If teleporting does stick around, a change I would like to see that would improve games like Half-Life Alex is to make teleportation targeting come from your eye line instead of having to point with your hand. I feel like this would be a much more natural way to move around and it would allow for multitasking like every other game. There are, however, a few games that have really clever solutions to get around these limitations. For instance, Budget Cuts, which deals with the teleportation in a really fun and clever way because it's not just a teleporting mechanic, it also acts like a spy cam, which is a really neat touch for a stealth game. But for every good VR game that puts a lot of thought into how to deal with these unique challenges, there's at least two or three games that are absolutely a waste of time. And it's no secret that there's a lot of not so great VR games on the market right now. I'm not sure if these games are trying to just ride VR hype, but they can't be that profitable. So the whole existence of them really doesn't make any sense to me. And weeding through them can be a bit of a challenge. You kind of have to pay attention to the reviews and look out for red flags about how the game plays and if there's anything that would cause you to be sick. Now, it might seem like I'm being a bit negative about VR, but I actually love VR. I really just want to show that even though it still has some kinks to work out, the potential for this medium is great. And while traditional gaming will not be replaced by it anytime soon, I absolutely believe that VR is here to stay and that it does have a place in the future of gaming.